Let's ride, Pedro. We're back, baby. Digging Weekly, presented by FanDuel. Head over to FanDuel.com slash Digging, D-I-G-G-I-N, to bet along with us at America's number one sports book. I tell you what, Pete, now that I'm out here in Connecticut, I'm able to mess on the app a little bit. There are some pretty fun stuff you can do on this FanDuel app. I got your boy Max Freed the other day at plus 900 to lead the night in strikeouts. Anytime you get Max Freed, and you can put 100 to win 900, I'm all over that. Plus 900, you got to take full advantage of it. Rewarded you with a nice little 13 punchy performance. Not bad by him. Sorry about that. Pete, we were out in San Diego. No, we were not in San Diego. We were in Kansas City this past weekend. We were doing some charity <laughs> out there. Keep us, hey, get us back up to speed. What was going on? What's going on in the world of baseball? Let me tell you, it's been a huge week in the world of gambling. I'm going to try this name, and I'm probably going to f*** it up, but here we go. Tucapito <laughs> Mas Marcano. From your Padres has had a tough week ah. betting on baseball, not winning, but betting on baseball. He only won 4.3% of his bets over 231 Major League Baseball related bets. Eric, I know, you know, I haven't been around the game for a long time. When somebody stands up and holds up a sheet of paper the size of my fucking head and mm. says, hey, you cannot do this. There's a lot of things you can get away with in this game. This is not one of them. You probably should listen. No, you're exactly right. This is where stuff gets serious. This is where the guys that are competing, the guys that are in that building, essentially, need to just hone in on the game, shut everything down in the outside world, because this is where it can get a little dangerous, a little dicey. And like you said, we have that meeting every spring, but hopefully now this can be a lesson for all the other players, a lifetime ban. There is no coming back from that, obviously. So hopefully it's a message for all the other players, all the other employees involved with everything, because... We need to keep the game as clean as possible. I think it's a lot of fun for people to throw some stuff on games if you're not involved, but we're getting to the point now where a couple of these things have happened, a couple of players, so we need to lock in on the game. We need to take that out and clean this stuff up for our game to continue to thrive, Pete. Speaking of thriving, we got a big heavyweight series out there in New York this week, L.A. going out there, the Dodgers playing the Yankees in the Bronx. Talk about heavyweight battle. I think, uh, obviously, the Phillies are probably the powerhouse of the NL right now, but the Dodgers are always going to be the Dodgers. And anytime you get two teams together like this, the Yankees are as hot as Aaron Judge is as hot as it gets. Like, they're a good team. They're about to get a couple of guys back. Garrett Cole's coming back for the injured list, which is frightening, really, when you think about it. That Yankees squad right now is an actual squad. It's a Battlestar Galactica. It's exactly what they used to be when that team would travel around and they just have a force behind them. They're a unit again. Honestly, they're a unit again. And as I said, when you have the Dodgers go anywhere, they're just coming with a fanfare, and it's almost like a, a, a traveling freaking tour show. Yes, two massive markets. And if we talk about a World Series preview, if this is our World Series in October, man, will that be exciting for our game. And something I mentioned yesterday on our FanDuel BetCast, and now you can kind of mix in the Dodgers along with this, but these are two teams that are kind of in the market for a third baseman. And if St. Louis ends up losing a couple more games out there, no. if Nolan Arenado is on that trade market and ends up to one of these places, wow. You talk about show squad. You're adding a superstar to one of those show squads. This is what I think is going to be maybe the biggest part of the 2024 story and who decides or what eventually decides who wins the World Series is what happens between now and the trade deadline. Because there are... A lot of teams that are carrying a lot of payroll, a lot of superstars, a lot of young studs. There's just so much to want to go and get. And teams have got to look internally and go, okay, we've got a chance to make ourselves either a lot better, a little bit better. You know, this is make or break time for a lot of teams, I think. It really is. And we talk about before the season, preseason, you would wish that every team is truly in it to win it. Now we get to the trade deadline. Now we identify those teams that are in it to win it. There's going to be some big time moves made. Something that we saw in free agency this past year, a lot of those big-time pitchers didn't come off the board until a certain time. Trade deadline, it's time to win. It's time right now. We go out and make these moves. But back to those pitchers, Montgomery, Blake Snell, we talk about how important it is for a pitcher to have their spring training, to get locked in with their new club, to stay healthy. And I think it is proving more than we could ever explain by watching what those guys are going through right now, and it kills me to watch that. Snell's hurt. Montgomery's getting booed. It just, it was set up to happen like this. Everybody who sees the slow developing offseason, this is there. This is what they're warning. Guys, this is what's going to happen. And now we're seeing it come to fruition. I just hope this is an example 
of why you need to maybe set a date that where guys need to start signing by because it's just getting out of hand and it's ruining. We're already at a, a point where pitchers are getting hurt like crazy. We can't afford to have guys who are the peak or at the peak of their pitching career go mm-hmm. down like this based on the fact that they weren't able to get a normal offseason like they have done their whole lives to this to this point. Yeah, we always talk about how you make the real adjustments and game reps. As a pitcher, as a starting pitcher, you can only do that every fifth day. So in spring training, it's already short enough when you have a couple weeks. You're going to get probably three to four games in with whatever new catcher, whoever you're working with, coaching staff, training staff. There's so much that goes into this. And, you know, I hate to see it. I hate to, you know, we brought up the Josh Hader situation last time, how his agent and him came up with a plan to protect their health. And as a starting pitcher now, it makes you think, do these guys need to come up with a plan? Do they need to have a certain date that if they don't sign by this, then they're sitting out the season? I know it hurts them. But I mean, at the end of the day, it's a dangerous avenue that this can be. And I hate to have that happen for our starting pitchers. But on the other side of that, real quick, and I'll let you go back in on this. Look at Tommy Pham. Look at what he's doing out there with the White Sox. And not only did he get off to a great start, but how impressive is that? Because... We're talking about position players not getting the looks that he can get in spring training, not getting the at-bats, but somehow found a way to stay ready and is producing out there in Chicago. But I know you wanted to touch on one more thing with the pitcher sledge, so go ahead. No, well, I just wanted to say that it not only just hurts them, it hurts the game. It, when we don't have mm-hmm. the best of the best competing at the best level, it hurts our overall product. Everybody wants to see the best go out there and compete, and when they're not able to, based on whatever the circumstances are, then it just sucks, like it does when Tommy Pham has to sit out, when you know he can hit, I don't know what it's like for a hitter to come in and be able to do what he's done because I know that a lot of the time those guys are like, man, I just can't get my timing down. There's just nothing like seeing that live pitching. And he's done it. He somehow managed to do it. He did. And he managed to stay ready on his own. I'm sure whatever, whenever spring training and the season started, I'm sure he had to drive somewhere to get a workout in, drive somewhere else to get at bats in. So kudos to Tommy Pham. And, and speaking of that, This is a guy that's on a one-year contract, is playing way under his value, got treated the way he got treated in the offseason, which was not right. And now look what he's doing. He is competing his ass off for a team that's going to get rid of him in a month. He's incentivized with his contract to get at bats to get more money. You see him going balls to the wall in that play at the plate with Contreras. (laughs) You see him not only, you know, hey, you're not going to challenge me as a man. Okay, I'm cool with you fist pumping to your team, but when you look at me and you start to do that, that's when we got an issue. And on top of all this, Tommy's out there setting the tone for the White Sox. And you got to know everybody in the White Sox organization. I mean, what a breath, breath of fresh air that was to get Tommy on board when when stuff's not Where really going well Where would they be well without him? There. Where would mm-hmm. they be right now without Tommy Fan? They've won 15 games in the season. They've, won, they've lost 13 in a row. They're talking about firing the manager already, which you and I both know is not the problem. It's mm-hmm. been the same problem there for five years. Like, I understand you're in a rebuilding situation, but there is a you've got an opportunity to go out there and make your team better this offseason and you do absolutely nothing. You are reaping what happens by sitting on your thumbs all offseason. Yeah, you really are. And now the difference, you know, you have Tommy Pham sitting there in the beginning of April. No one's interested. This is all they want. Now the trade deadline comes. He's going to have about six or, te- six or seven teams calling trying to get him to be that starting left fielder for them at the top of the lineup. He needs to start doing the Roger Clemens thing and just start roll it up in June, playing the second half and getting a full year salary for it because that's the way, it's the only way it's going to make sense from this point. Yeah, that's essentially what's happening. And I will say this, Chicago White Sox are going to Boston this weekend. We're playing the law of averages right here, Pete. They will win this series. Look for that in the FanDuel Sportsbook app. Look for those what? series prices. They will win this series, Pete. It is a law of averages. We got the big lefty uh, going game look, one. You're right. You're We're right. going to set the tone there and we just need to win one of the next two. But I feel pretty confident, Pete. I'm telling you, Chicago is going to win that series this weekend. Got mock it. Down. Mock it down. I've Speaking of this weekend, down. we got another huge series going out there to London. Mets versus the Phillies. We got two games Saturday and Sunday. Here's my thing with the London series. It's going to be the first day out there. Guys are going to get acclimated. They're going to get used to all this stuff. The second day in London, I feel like that's when the runs come about. I'm looking to hammer some overs out there that second day. I think there's going to be a lot of runs scored. I think it's going to be time for all those bats to wake up before heading home. And I don't know if you remember, but I do remember the Yankees and the Red Sox series a couple years ago. And I feel like the stadium 
was meant for homers. It's a soccer stadium turned into baseball field. The balls are going to be flying out there, Pete. Let me tell you something. There's two things that I'm an expert in. Injuries <laughs> and jet lag. And jet lag <laughs> is definitely something that they're going to be dealing with over there. So I am all on that bet, dude. The second day is going to be an absolute, it's going to be a rocket fest. They set the fields up for entertainment, like you know. This is this London people are going to want to see homers. There's going to be homers galore. It's going to be, it's going to be homers galore. Speaking of homers galore, I don't mind digging myself right now because I nailed Dinger Tuesday last week with Josh Naylor. He might be our new king slash. We might have to put it on him right now. Those the guardians might be my new king. Are you shitting me? That whole squad is doing that. This isn't possible. This is not what you sign up for. I still think that the central may be the weakest division, but when you've got four teams, three teams competing like they are right now, it's insane. It really is. And and I tell you what, the guardians, they're not losing right now, and it's unbelievable. So when I sent out the pick for Dinger Tuesday, I got all hyped up because I saw Josh Naylor's leading the league on Homers and Tuesdays. So I'm like, okay, this is my boy. He's hitting a homer tonight. Little did I know they were facing Seth Lugo and the Kansas City Royals that night. So some of my some some of my big time friends out there in Kansas City were not happy with me on X. Like, so <laughs> I'm just happy that we. I'm happy that Nails cashed it in for us. It gave me a breath of fresh air. I, I'm able to now apologize to my Kansas City folks out there. We'll never be did on the other the side of another bet again. Did you win the bet? We did. He hit a homer. You got a bet he with your head. In. Not with hey, your heart, Hoss. Not your heart. Not your heart. Speaking of betting with your heart or picking with your heart, there's a young Aussie out there that's going to be a top three pick in this year's draft. Isn't that nuts? Like, we've never had a, a, a guy go – I don't think we've had a, a guy go first round as an Aussie because a lot of guys will sign as international free as agents. Travis Bazana has come over here. He went to college. i got to be honest with you. We're going to have him on before the draft, just a little sneak yes. preview. But i got to be honest with you, I'll tell this between you and I, I didn't think he was very good. I played against him when I was still pitching back in the ABL. He was a little second baseman, and I'm like, man, this kid's going to be okay, but he's not going to be anything special. Five years later, he's gone to driveline. He's worked on his swing. He's just a hitter. It's, he's just a hitter. He's just been announced as the finalist in the Golden Spikes Award. He's mm. supposed to go top five in the draft. He's going to be the next greatest thing to come out of Australia, and I'm all for it, dude. I'm fired up. I'm more fired up to hear what he thought about you now. I can't wait to hear that <laughs> truth and see what he's got. <laughs> uh, hey, college so baseball, true. we got the regionals just uh, just wrapped up. Super regionals coming up. You yeah. know, I've obviously I've shared my fair share of uh, jokes about college baseball, but I will say this: it is going to be an exciting time. Those games always come down to the wire, and once you get out there in Omaha, anything can happen. Well, this all the lead up. So I didn't know anything about this. Funny story. I did an ACC tournament in the booth, my first ever games in the booth. And I had no mm. idea what a regional was, what a super regional was, where these guys came from to get where they were and where they were going afterwards. So it was a lot of fun. It was a learning process for me. I've dived in a little bit more now. I understand it. But it's some of the stories that you get from those schools that aren't supposed to be at the super regionals that somehow fight their way through. They're some of the cool stories too. LSU gets taken down. There's a lot of stories to go through, but there's a there's a lot still to come too. It all starts this weekend. No doubt. And and I remember watching last year, two years ago, whenever it was, when we're watching Paul Skeens go up against Wake Forest. It was another great pitching matchup. And you're sitting there watching the game. You're thinking, all right, this dude, Paul Skeens, he throws hard. He's got a slider. But when he gets to the big leagues, man, they're going to hit that heater. You know you can't just get to the big leagues and dominate with the heater. And he went the other night and faced Mookie Betts, Shohei Otani, and was pumping nothing but heaters first time through. Got him. Next time through, him and Shohei pumps two more swings through it. Shohei gets him on the third one. But, man, you talk about – we talked about heavyweight battles in the beginning. That was must-see TV. That was show-stopping. That was like – that had, must have had MLB absolutely drooling from everywhere, especially the way that it happened. It was like a main event where, you know, the contender gets knocked down early on but then comes back and makes a uh, – you know, a, a late late ring – a late what? Yeah, we're there. We're good. A, a late fight <laughs> knockout. Jeez, there I am. You know what I'm trying to say. You see Skeens punching with three straight heaters, and then you see Otani. Obviously, it was an O2 heater right down the middle. You you probably could have le elevated that, Hoz. But... I don't know. Not anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> hey, yeah, not it was anymore. awesome. That's exactly an, what you signed up for. Hey, I hit an unbelievable fly ball against Mason Miller in my last year of the career. And I'm telling you what, if I could have just... 
my thing yeah. was if I had take too away much the month of May. Angle. You're an all star. Here we go. That's what I mean, I had too much launch angle. I needed to get the ball closer to the ground, closer to Earth. That's where I live, Sledge. You know Fair that. Fair enough. I've called I you Sledge that. three times this uh, on this show, so I'm just going to go I ahead mean, and apologize to the to the Moylan family, Mandy. That's it's something that I just can't control. She doesn't watch this. She doesn't she watch <laughs> this. She's too busy. Target, man. Come on. <laughs> Target, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> but I will say this. Okay, so. On the Wednesday betcast for FanDuel, I was talking to Rob, Pitching Ninja, and I said the same exact thing. Paul Skeens' is over-under for strikeouts was seven and a half, I believe. Six and a half or seven and a half. And I told Rob, I said, Rob, this lineup right here, it's a different lineup. I don't see any way possible of this dude going over that amount of strikeouts. And after watching that first inning, I'm like, okay, what are the futures odds for him to win Rookie of the Year? Right. Because yeah. I am all on that. I'm a believer, man. And and just to say, you know, as a teammate as well, to see that guy challenge those dudes with heaters in the zone, yeah. he's the furthest thing from scared. And I also think that we haven't even seen close to his best. I've seen games where he was in the minor leagues and he was in control, like actual complete control and able to dot with not just one far, not just one pitch. He was able to dot with with two or three pitches. And it was just, it was elite. Eric, it was, mm -hmm. I think you're right. I think Rookie of the Year could be in his future for sure. Yeah, he's throwing that splinker now at 98 miles an hour, which is absolutely yep. disgusting. But speaking of elite, when you look at the National League, there's four teams that are over 500 right now. Does that yep. blow your mind? Hold on, what? Four that four are over 500. That are over 500. Only four winning teams in the National League. But it's basically Colorado and the Florida Marlins. Everybody else is two, within three, four games of the wild card situation right now. That's exactly what we want as a sport. Yes. But yes. there's enough bulk now where you're seeing what a true team is. And I feel like through the end of June, that's where teams really establish what they're going to be. So you're right. There's a lot going on. There's teams that are in contention that probably shouldn't be. There's the trade deadline coming up that they could either help or hurt themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, GMs, this is where the GMs are on the hot seat and, and it's... Uh, this is a, a fun time to be a baseball fan. It is. This is the time now where we got some all-star voting happening. We got a lot of names being brought up as potential trade targets, potential situations. So like we broke down last time, it's right around now when a losing team that's going to be sellers, so to speak, if they have guys that they figure that they can possibly hang on to, you're going to offer your extensions right now. If the guys say no, they then become on the trade block. They're going to try and cash in, get multiple prospects back. So that is interesting. This is stuff I to, never thought about to that. Start looking for. Start looking for so those. So I never thought about that. That that's his, which is when they're going to be like, okay, let's see if we can steal this kid cheap, throw mm -hmm. him a bullshit offer before we decide to trade him, and if he signs it, it's a win-win. If he doesn't, then we'll pick up and we'll find something else. I have never, in my history, of baseball, thought of it that way. Yeah, that's the process. That's how it goes. If it's a player they identify and they want to keep or potentially keep, you're going one number, not going over that, and then if so. You're trading him. He's gone. And that's just kind of how it is. But when you look at the National League, too, I think a big factor that we need to pay attention to is that home field advantage. Because if L.A. has got to run through Philly, playing in Philly, that's going to be a tough matchup for them to get through to go to the World Series. And here's the other issue with L.A. always being in it, is that travel sucks. Mm -hmm. If you're playing in the National League Championship Series, Philly, L.A., think about that flight. Philly, Atlanta, it's like... It's just a nightmare. You're throwing on a cross-country flight in between potentially twice or two or three times throughout that series. It yeah. becomes a huge factor. And LA is kind of used to it. They really are. And we're getting to that point now where we're going down the stretch, second half. You're going to start seeing, I hope, you're going to start seeing a lot of starters going deep into games. You're going to see right. these guys empty the tank. We got Garrett Cole and Max Scherzer coming back. And just looking at those highlights of Garrett Cole and his rehab start, you talk about boring and like looking too easy. It was. It just looked way too easy for this guy. That's just, he's a robot when he gets going. Obviously, he's as good as it gets in the game. He said that he's not quite ready yet. Maybe another another start and he'll be back. But Scherzer, the same thing. Cole's wife ended up catching a foul ball during the game. I'm not sure if you saw that. but <laughs> So she's obviously a star. Kid's going to be it. Already probably looking at futures for his kid right now, are you hoes? Or <laughs> just runs, just runs in the family out there. My gosh. But I mean, when you look at Philly and you look at the Yankees starting staff and the Dodgers, I mean, these guys are getting starting pitching at a premium right now. Yeah. And I think that's why we're seeing these guys that are 15, 20 games over 500. 
And the Yankees right now, with their starters, what they're doing, it's fun because the Yankees heading in, a lot of people said these guys have a lot of unique personalities. It's going to be hard for them to mesh as a team. But when you have Aaron Judge as your captain, you have no choice but to buy in, especially playing out there in New York. It's the biggest market. They've turned it around. I didn't expect them to be this good. They've probably been disappointing over the last couple of years, if you ask a Yankees fan. So for a Yankees fan, they're setting it up well, too, with what they've got coming back, with Cole coming back. You see the Braves right now. They're having, they've are having. they almost got like a six-man rotation where they're giving guys an extra day rest at the mm -hmm. moment. It feels like the Yankees and the Phillies are just going to be what they are. The Braves are having to find a way to get themselves to peak at the right end of the season right now because they're dealing with injuries and they're having to work around different scenarios that not a lot of teams are having to deal with. But I think it's just it's going to be so fascinating to see if these these powerhouses can hang on or if a little upstart like the Diamondbacks or even St. Louis is starting to play good again. Like It's crazy that there's just been turnarounds from teams except for the White Sox and Rockies. Yeah, and even when we look at starting pitching, you know, we talked about earlier with Snell and Montgomery, the the free agency and these teams not wanting to invest. And you look at these starting staffs that are being successful, it's all veteran-led staffs. And Charlie Morton out there in Atlanta, Chris Sale. Again, speaking on the, the, the Cy Young odds, Chris Sale is top five in there. And how good is it to see Chris Sale back healthy doing what he's doing, especially for you out there in Atlanta? You're seeing it every fifth day. NL Pitch of the Month, 5-0, and 32 innings, 42 punch-outs, a .56 ERA for the month. He had a bit of a stinker, his first outing in June. But when you talk about the bulk of May, it was just, you knew what you were going to get every time he went out there. And I get to talk about him almost every time he's out there because of my job, obviously. But he's not like he's a finesse guy. He's not finessing his way through a lineup. He is overpowering people and intimidating people to swing at shit that you just shouldn't swing at. And it's been fun to watch. Man, it's been fun to watch. I tell you what, if if they still had Strider in there, that would be it. Would be crazy come down here in the stretch of October, September. If my grandmother had wheels, she'd be a bike, Eric. <laughs> little, little different than the old. Oh, if you just took two outings out in uh, June and July, I would have been sub two, and I would have been an all star that year. Real quick, I want to hit on two other awards before I hit on the big. Award of the month and uh, Luis Gill. Did you have him written down as your pitcher of the month? No. Oh, six man. and oh. Six and oh. 38 innings, 44 punch outs, 0.7 ERA. Great job by you. Bryce Harper won the NL Player of the Month with a 313 average and 990 OPS and a seven home run month, which sounds fantastic until you go to Aaron Judge's number. I'll let you read them out, Eric. Go for your life. I mean, Aaron Judge, my goodness. I don't have the numbers. I'm not homers. a big numbers guy in front of me. You know 14 this. 14 homers. A 14, 14. 14 homers. A 1.4 OPS. The next best was a 1.061. He had a 4.88 on base percentage. The next best was only 4.50. He slugged 9.20 for the season. So for, sorry, for the month. And the next best was 6.86. He had an, un, an average exit velo of 100 miles an hour, and he batted 371. And we talked about it last episode or last uh, last week's show. He is putting himself in a different conversation as far as these numbers he's putting up. Best hitter in the league right now. No one's close. Obviously, he had a little bit of struggles in, in April, but for such a massive human to be in control like he is of his own body, the way that he is, it's it's incredible. It really is. Again, I told you I'm out here on this FanDuel app scrolling through, looking at some specials. There's a special for Aaron Judge to hit 60-plus homers, and I'm pretty close to thinking about pulling the trigger on this. He is, after hitting 16 in a month, mentally he's got to be on top of the world. He knows he did it last year. He busted out of his little so-called slow start, whatever it is. I mean, this guy, I don't see him slowing down anytime soon. I, I think... If the Yankees are going to be anything, which seems, seems funny to say, because they've got Soto sitting right behind him too, who's also had a pretty freaking incredible month, but he just gets overshadowed by Aaron Judge. Those two back to back in the lineup is kind of it's now that I think about that in playoff time. Throw Arenado in there too, Pete. I'm telling you, oh, you can come get dangerous on, out there and get real hey, dangerous. There's more teams than just the Yankees that are searching for people too, by the way. Yeah, but we need the Yankees to be the Yankees and go out and get those dudes again. <laughs> I don't. It's been about 25 years since that happened. We need it. All Let's right. go. Speaking that of, are we going to get how much pressure? We talked about Cashman a little bit. We talked about the front office last week. How much pressure is on the Yankees now to sign Soto? 
I think it's all on them to sign Soto, but I just don't know that. They, do you think they're in discussions right now? They have to be. If, if, I mean, how can you not be, right? Yeah. I mean, you you would think that. I just don't know if you can't come out as an ownership and say that we don't have any money to sign Soto and then somehow come out and say, well, I guess we were just tricking. Here's our wallet because hey, you're the Yankees. Everybody this, has money. This Go is part and of sign the, the best player. Yeah, exactly. Part of the game. You see Soto starting to take off. You see the price tag is slowly just increasing. Now you start playing the game through the media. Now you start saying, hey, there's no way we can sustain this payroll. There's no way we can pay this amount for a player. If they go and make a move in the trade deadline, yeah, we took on this contract. There's no way we can add another $40 million plus dollar contract on there. The Yankees are going to make it so hard for Soto to sign back by the stuff that they say publicly because – they know the pressure's on them right now, and it truly is. I have an answer. Come on. And look, this is out of left field. If we can just organize uh, ourselves some TV deals like the NBA just did, everybody's going to make what Soto's making because those were asked in the billions, Eric. Billions. Billions. We don't have to talk about this because billions. I don't know enough about it. But they were talking about $76 billion for TV rights over three channels. Yes, we certainly will talk about this. And... Somebody that I would love to have on at some point in time, Max Scherzer, is very involved in the Players Union, the Players Association, all the CBA negotiations, all that type of thing. And it makes you wonder, when we were talking about this last night via text message, does MLB now go, do you go to a salary cap? Because if the Not game sure. continues to grow in revenue like NBA, they just signed this massive deal, that goes yeah. directly to the player's salary. And we got NBA players now making close to $60 million a year. There's obviously less players to try to cover at the same time, but mm -hmm. I mean the NFL seems to be able to find a way to get their get their payers played, paid, yes. played, paid. So the salary cap thing scares the shit out of me, obviously, because it's just it's frightening to think that there's a limit to what you can have your guys make. But if that salary cap seems to be over and above what teams are willing to spend right now, then maybe it's a positive, and you can. Do not clip this because I will get reamed from saying that. But these are the things you have to talk about. Maybe we start thinking about what other options are. Because if you can tag the salary cap or a salary floor to the percentage of revenue and have everybody getting a fair amount, then that makes sense to me. It does. And obviously now the way the luxury tax is set up, a lot of players think allegedly that that is a salary cap. So that's what holds it down or holds these contracts from you know getting crazy like basketball is getting. So- Again, I'm with you. These are stuff that obviously this is closer to the offseason. We're getting through this first half now. It's going to be playoff time. But when the offseason comes, these are questions that I certainly have and would love to get educated on. And speaking of offseason, this is a monster offseason for our boy Scott Boris here. We talked about Soto. He's got Alonzo. He's got a lot of guys that are opting out of that, which you would think last year's deal He's going to have a lot of guys on this free agent market. And, you know, we just talked about Soto. It's time to set some records. And this is going to be a monster offseason, you would think, for Scott. I really hope so. And I really hope that they've they've been able to look at the last couple of years and come up with a plan to get teams spending early on. I know there was a there was before the lockout, there was a huge amount of spending going on with teams wanting to get people locked in. I understand that. But we need that kind of uh, energy at the start of the off season, even without the incentive of fucking lockout. <laughs> yes, yes, we need it. We're hey, listen, we're gonna have Scott back on here as well. Obviously, there's there's some legal stuff in there that he can't say when he's going through these negotiations with the players. But at the end of the day, we can pick his brain. We can talk about the stuff that he can talk about. So that'll be fun stuff for us to lead into. Dallas and Kelly Keiko two days ago released the episode on Wednesday. Love and baseball, and you talk about just. I mean, Dallas is as pro as it gets, and Kelly is somebody that's been with the network for a while. If you're able to make the postseason, you usually see her on the field there covering the game. But it's funny, Pete, how baseball, and now you being on the other side of it in the media world, how it becomes a family on how everyone spends so much time at the ballpark, and we get to dive into it a little more with Kelly and Dallas. It was so cool hearing Kelly's story, where she came from, you know, growing up, going out and working for nothing. And then mm -hmm. you see Dallas... When I first met Dallas was in the Houston clubhouse. Not many people know this, but I was in spring training with the Astros in 14 when he was there competing for the fifth starter spot and two years later went to Cy Young. So it was really cool to see that transition too. And that whole clubhouse, I was there in 14 when analytics were being introduced and it was kind of new and shifting and this, that and the other. So to see that team and him and the way that he grew was just, a, it's a really fun story. 
Yes, he came. He got the beard going. He he got famous as fuck, as like we said, and he just <laughs> took off. And there's a really cool story that he shares with us in there about how the whole Justin Verlander trade happened because Dallas was very vocal when the when the Astros didn't go make a move at the deadline. There was still an old rule in place on the the waiver waivers or claim waivers, whatever it was. He yeah. made it happen for basically Houston to go out and get Justin Verlander, and that yeah. brought them home a title. It's a very yeah. cool story on there that a lot of people need to check out. I think everyone's going to enjoy that real, real much. Hold on. Real much? You and I have – words are tough today for us. <laughs> I was like, all right, I'm just going to let them edit that one out. That was bad. Real much. Oh, let me tell you much. something. It's hey. real much, yo. <laughs> hey, we're still recovering from uh, the old big slick Kansas out there City. in Kansas City. Yeah. I did say weekend. San Diego we didn't to start to talk the about thing, it. So. We didn't even My get to God. talk about it. I know. We'll, hey, we, there's certain things we can and can't talk about, Pete. Fair enough. Fair enough. All right, buddy. We'll see you next week. Sledgehammer. Oh, there it is, guys. Sledgehammer. <laughs>